continue to provide education and outreach um, in the area of cover crops, of course. And so we put together a webinar series that starts today and will go through October. And these are meant to be short form webinars. So essentially they're um, 30 minutes out of your day, short snippets about practical and relevant um, cover crop information that we hope that you can utilize. Um, and so today's webinar will be presented to us by Victoria Ackroyd from the University of Maryland um, on the topic of cover crop species selection for, agronom for agronomic systems. And she'll be talking about the um, cover crop selection tool. All the webinars, as I said, will be short. They'll be about 20 minutes long and we'll leave some time for questions. They will be recorded and posted um, as soon as we can get them up. So if you miss one, you can go back and watch it um, you know, at, at your leisure. Uh, today's webinar will qualify you for a half a CCA CEU credit in the topic of crop management. So stay on and we'll put up the QR code at the end of the webinar. Okay, so the webinar series, I think Susan just had the slide up, there we go. So you can see all the different topics that, and speakers that uh, will be offering these short webinars throughout the fall. Um, so we hope we you can join us for all of those. So again, I wanna welcome Dr. Victoria Ackroyd who's an assistant research scientist in the lab of Dr. Kate Tully at the University of Maryland. Many of you know Victoria. She's been the coordinator for the Northeast Cover Crop Council for many years, actually, I think since its inception. Um, she's a visiting scientist with Dr. Stephen Mursky's lab in Beltsville, Maryland. She earned her BS from in environmental horticulture in Florida and an MS at Michigan State, and then completed her PhD at Michigan State focused on cover crops. So welcome, Victoria, and I will turn the webinar over to you. Just a reminder, uh, if folks have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat, and um, we'll be asking Victoria those questions when she's finished with her webinar. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'd like to start out by everybody just taking a deep breath and breathing out and going, wow, it's almost the end of summer and it's been a hectic summer. Um, but here we are settling in towards the fall. And as we know, one of the key things that we like to do in the fall is to ideally plant cover crops. So hopefully you guys already have some plans in place. Uh, but if you don't, um, hopefully today's information will be useful for you and obviously in the future as well. Um, I do want to point out that my email address is down here at the bottom. Uh, if you've seen an email address from me from ARS, that one works too. My inbox is always open. So let's go on ahead and just jump right in. There are a lot of tools and resources out there to help you with the whole selecting cover crops to use. Um, there have been a lot of tools developed by public entities such as USDA, NRCS, various uh, universities, and of course, the Cover Crop Council, as you can see the map there, the Cover Crop Council coverage now covers the whole US. Um, the Westerners recently incorporated as well. Um, obviously, there are also tools developed by the ag industry and assorted related private entities, such as, you know, uh, Green Cover's Smart Mix tool. Um, and of course, there's what I always think of as the Bible for cover crops, which is managing cover crops profitably. Today, I'm going to be speaking within the context of the two species selector tools. Well, one's a seeding rate calculator and a mix maker. But anyway, two tools developed by um, the Northeast Cover Crops Council in conjunction with the Precision Sustainable Agriculture Network, which is a grant funded huge on farm research network uh, that's been throwing data into these tools and driving development. So if you see screenshots, what you're looking at is either coming from covercrop-selector.org or covercrop-seedcalc.org. You can see those URLs right there. You're welcome to play with the tools while I work through this presentation. I do wanna point out that this is not a training on these tools. I'm just using them to provide visuals 
um, and to help kind of structure this talk today about some of the considerations for cover crop species selection. Um, with that said, uh, the tools are meant to be easy to use. So by all means, there's our plug for the tools. So when you go to pick a cover crop species to plant, you're gonna start by considering your goals. What do you need out of that cover crop? What benefits are you looking for? Um, possibly you're concerned about improving soil structure. Maybe you're looking for some help with weed management. Possibly you're concerned about throwing some nitrogen into that system. Um, you might be needing feed or fodder for animals. And you might be looking for a cover crop because you're participating in some sort of a cost share participation program. Um, I do wanna point out that no matter what tool or resource you're using, you always need to go back to your point of contact if you're working with a cost share program to make sure that what you've come up with matches their requirements because every program is different. They do sometimes change a little bit year to year and logistically we have, we're not set up to keep up with that. And so whatever you come up with when you're selecting cover crops and their seeding rates, if you're participating in cost share, go back to your point of contact and double check with them, please. Now, uh, when you're considering your goals and you're using some of these tools that are out there, whether it's the original Midwest Cover Crop Council's uh, species selector or whether it's the versions that are up for the Northeast and South and soon to be for the West, um, you will run into some sort of a goals page and you see the screenshot here. And a lot of these goals are very straightforward. You know, if you're looking for improved soil structure, you can find words like increased soil aggregation there. If you're looking to add nitrogen to your system, nitrogen fixation is in virtually every tool and resource I've seen. And so you can simply click on that um, to help start screening out cover crop species that do and do not work for you. However, you might have a goal that's a little bit more complicated than simply good grazing. Um, even if a given tool seems to lack a goal that you're interested in, you can still potentially get there from here um, to get assistance from these tools with picking your cover crops. Uh, for example, if you think about what goes into water quality, well, you think water quality, I need to cut down on what's going into the water from my field. So that means soil. So that means I need to decrease erosion, um, fall and spring. And depending on which region you're in, you know, different types of erosion are of different concern in different seasons and each region's goal each region's tools uh, takes that into account. Um, obviously, nitrogen scavenging, you, you want nitrogen and phosphorus to not be running off of your fields. And so um, most of these tools let you pick, you know, one to three goals. And if you pick those three goals, you're pretty well on your way to discovering what species are gonna be best at helping you to improve water quality. Um, let's move forward here. There we go. Uh, so obviously the goals are the starting point, um, but you're still gonna have system constraints. So you guys have signed on for the Selecting Cover Crops for Agronomic uh, Systems webinar. And so I have put into this tool, um, the planting and harvest dates for corn, and I just kind of pie in the sky it May 1st through October 1st, which is if anything, a little bit optimistic on the harvest for something like corn. Um, and so you can see the pink bar across the screen here shows you when the cash crop is going to be in the field at the same time as the cover crop. So there's a constraint. Um, if you do not have the ability to interseed or aerial seed, then you are going to be selecting a cover crop whose planting window falls outside of that cash crop window. Uh, in future years, you might actually consider making it a little bit easier on yourself by buying, you know, slightly shorter day corn or a slightly earlier maturity group soybean. Um, but that really starts to get into the weeds of, you know, talk with your your, your cropping system advisors and whatnot. Uh, so anyway, the, the point here is that one of your constraints for when you're selecting your cover crop is obviously going to be your planting and harvest dates. Um, sometimes people need to push it you know, the field is too wet in the fall, it takes too long to dry down, and you still really want to get out there. And so our tool is set up so that you've got these teal blocks, which means safe to plant, and you've got the yellow blocks, which means, 
you know, there may be a temperature or moisture risk to establishment, but you can still try it. You know, if your year is running warm and dry or warm and decent rainfall, you might get away with putting in, for example, hairy vetch down here in the middle of October. Um, and while I'm on the screen, I do want to point out my favorite use case when I'm showing screenshots of these tools is nitrogen fixation and prevents fall erosion. And we'll get to why in a few minutes. So aside from when your cash crop is in the field, you also also need to consider um, how much time you have to plant and what sort of equipment you have available. And so over here on the left, when you go to the output screen in our tool, we have a bunch of what we call filters. And the goals that we clicked over on that first page, nitrogen fixation and decrease erosion, were one of the first screening constraints. These filters provide basically a secondary way to screen out and therefore hone down your recommendations. And so I looked at that screen and I went, wow, there's a lot of species, but at the same time, my farmer just doesn't have a lot of time in the fall to be in the field. Uh, what could that farmer plant? Um, and so I said, well, he has the equipment to frost seed and that's something he'd like to work with. So let's click, can he frost seed? Yes. And wow, that super duper narrows down your options. Everything's grayed out except red clover. Um, there you go. Uh, along with planting, you know, equipment and time to get the, the, the cover crop into the field, you also have to consider the constraint in the form of termination timing and again, the equipment available. So again, this is a filter that we've got on the left side of the screen that you can use. And these are ratings where one means it doesn't work at all and five means it works really well. Um, anywhere in this tool that you see a, a question mark with a circle around it, you can mouse over it and it'll bring up the definition, including... Uh, what the ratings mean, because it's easy to lose track of the scales in your head, but we have very much annotated this tool. Just mouse over and you'll see what you're looking for there. So some springs are wet, some springs are dry, and some springs you'd rather be visiting family in Florida. Either way, you have to consider what you're facing in the spring. And so again, to show you guys how you can narrow down your options here, um, I decided that maybe this farmer is organic. And so they are going to struggle with using herbicides because there's virtually no herbicides you can use for organic systems to terminate cover crops. So he has a roller crimper or she has a roller crimper and she'd like to do that. Maybe they're looking to plant green or maybe they just like the idea of getting as much biomass out there as they can. Um, so letting it grow as long as possible. So I've clicked under termination five. I want, I want the species that are the best for roller crimping at flowering. And as you can see, you have some options. Now, on this previous screen, you can see that red clover was an option. And in terms of goal one, that was nitrogen fixation. It was the best. And it was the only frost seeding option. Here, you can see that your options in terms of roller crimping are really mostly limited for this location, which I put in Maryland, um, to the grasses. And so um, obviously, first off, you would not aerial seed and then roller crimp because that's like a three month growing period. That's terrible. But just giving you uh, an example of how you may find that nothing meets both of your goals at the same time. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, so again, uh, considering constraints, you've got environmental conditions that you've got to deal with. And I decided to make uh, this interesting in terms of, well, this field is kind of wet. So I want something that is flood tolerant. And so I clicked, I want things that are rated at least a four or a five. So they're best for, you know, wet soil. And in this case, we've got spring oats or annual ryegrass. Again, I've moused over the goal, which reminds me that um, goal two for me was prevent fall soil erosion. And you can see that you know, there are no legumes that are super high rated for wet ground in this case. Now, the reason why I have not clicked all of these filters on top of each other and shown you uh, the output from that is because you wouldn't have output. Um, if you wanted something that could be aerial seeded and also roller crimped and also very flood tolerant, um, each of these choices is bringing up different options. Uh, and so you do kind of have to play with it. 
to a greater or lesser extent. Um, come here. No, I want to go backwards. I'm sorry. Okay. Environmental conditions. Okay. So I was just talking about flood tolerance. Excellent. So again, um, you have a lot of options for the environmental tolerances. Use the filters. You know, you, you can look at um, growth characteristics if you need something that grows quickly. Um, things that can overwinter versus not overwinter. You guys are here because of the agronomic systems interest. And so probably you're talking fall planted cover crops. Um, you know, the vegetable folks sometimes like something that can get in and out in six weeks. And so this tool is also set up to screen for some of those things. This tool is primarily set up for agronomic systems, but especially in the Northeast and actually in the South and the Midwest too, um, we took into account, you know, vegetables are a significant portion of it. We've even got grazing for the South. We've got, um, you know, like berry bushes and whatnot set up for for especially the Northeast and the West. Um, the Midwest actually has a separate tool for vegetable systems. So anyway, trying to get back out of the weeds there, sorry about that. Um, aside from considering your environmental conditions, you're gonna need to check potentially for issues of specific concern. So anywhere in this tool that you see a species, you can click on the species, you see how it's underlined. That's basically a hyperlink. You can also click view details wherever that shows up in this tool and it will bring up the information sheet that has all of the information in the tool for your location um, for that given cover crop. Now, the information sheet is too long for me to have fit into one neat screenshot. So I've got what the top looks like up here, the top right of my slide, and then the extended comments I'm gonna get to in a second. And so all the info sheets have a quick summary and as many pictures as we could provide. And then it just literally goes down with um, accordion sections that you can open and close looking at different things. And so issues of specific concern can turn up in the uh, cover crop decision, excuse me, cover crop description. For example, um, mixes well with barley, annual ryegrass and cereal rye. Um, so if you wanna go more seed of your pants than just doing whatever the output spits out on the previous screens, you can look here and, and kind of, you know, use your judgment, which you're gonna have to do anyway. And then definitely go down and look at the extended comments. So for example, um, under termination, we have this warning. If you're using herbicides to terminate, use a tank mixture. Uh, don't rely on glyphosate alone. A lot of the clovers are, you know, a little bit persnickety and they're not easy to kill with just Roundup. Um, you know, sometimes there's warnings in here where necessary about, you know, when, when and where not to graze. So we made this tool as thorough as we could, um, but obviously cover crops have things you have to be careful about, uh, not just things that they can do for you. And so definitely keep an eye on specifics if you're doing something like grazing or, you know, hairy vetch can contaminate wheat. So uh, wheat farmers tend to avoid that one. That warrant sort of warning is in here too. Now, I've just gone through a lot of output and most of the screens have looked like this one with just the long list and you know colored at the top and then grayed out at the bottom for the recommendations. But maybe you want to do a side-by-side -side comparison, a deeper dive. Um, the cool thing about this selector tool is that you can add cover crops of interest to your list. Um, literally over here on the right side of the screen, my list, you click the plus button and you can add up to I think five. And so in this case, I'm still working with goals of nitrogen fixation and decreased fall erosion. And I'm still in the state of Maryland for my location. And I've decided that I want a mix of something that has strong um, output for goal one. So, so a legume basically, the nitrogen fixation, that means legume. And then goal two um, with decreasing erosion is gonna be something that's not a legume. So I scrolled down and picked a couple of species for that. Then I went on ahead and I clicked my selected crops and this brought up a screen that looks like this. So I've got my four, four that I selected, winter rye, crimson clover, cowpea, sudex. And for the purposes of this example, I was very careful about picking those. So you can click view all in this screen under um, the filters on the left and it will bring up 
just like in the information sheet, all of the information that we have for a given location in the tool for that species. And you can just go across head to head and you can decide, you know, volunteer establishment, winter rye is rated super high for that. Oh my goodness, I'm worried about it becoming a weed in my next crop. Maybe I don't want to do that one. Um, alternately, if you don't want to look through all the parameters, you could say, well, I'm in an agronomic system. I need something that's going to overwinter. And so on the uh, left under the filters, you can go on ahead and click um, always survives the winter. And this is why I picked the species I did to show you this. So down here, we've got our goals, nitrogen fixation, no data. Um, that's because it's the answer is effectively no, um, only legumes uh, fix nitrogen. So our grasses are not going to be good for fixing nitrogen. They can be good for scavenging, but that's a different goal and I didn't click it. Um, whereas our two legumes are good, super good for fixing nitrogen. Um, and then my other goal, which was prevent fall erosion, as expected when I set up this example, uh, the two legumes are not great for preventing fall erosion. And the two grasses are. So where's my deciding factor? My deciding factor is I planted corn and coming up, I'm going to plant maybe soybeans. And so my chance to plant is going to be in the fall. So I need something that's going to survive the winter. Expected for cereal rye, expected for crimson clover, never for cowpea and never for sudex. They're summer annuals. That doesn't surprise me. And so there's my screening point. Uh, you know, if, if this was all I was concerned about, I'd pick rye and crimson clover in this case. So what's missing? What is everybody super concerned about? Mixtures. Well, first off, this tool specifically, the species selector, is not meant to help you make mixtures. However, um, there's a couple of things you can do. Either you know, you can look at the different species that are of interest and you can just generate a mixture in your mind based on what looks interesting, combining strengths and weaknesses for the different cover crops while thinking about your system constraints, you know, how you can plant them. You The bigger seeded things like winter pea need to be drilled. So if you don't have a drill, that's going to knock out things like that. Um, Alternately, uh, you can pick species individually, however you choose to use the tool, this species selector tool, or you can just go straight to our seeding rate calculator, which is also a mix maker. There's the URL. You can link, you can find it on the Northeast Cover Crops website. Um, I don't have time today to go into that. I do want to point out that my presentation has begun to set up for a lot of the other presentations that we're going to be going through this year. Um, I'm not going to read these out loud, but they're available on our website. They're available where you registered. Um, and so hopefully I've gotten us on to a good start with uh, general species selection, especially when you're thinking agronomic systems. Um, I do need to acknowledge all of our folks that have helped us with these tools that work with the Northeast Cover Crops Council and the rest of the councils. Um, all of the resources that we provide come through the work of folks with government agencies like ARS and NRCS and universities like Extension and also, um, you know, the seed industry and farmers. And so we thank everybody who's assisted with the development and collating of these resources and obviously our funders. That brings me to the end and I'm maybe only two minutes or three minutes past, so I can take questions now. And maybe Susan can throw up the um, the QR code information. Uh, share. Um, there we go. Stop sharing. There. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> that was great. We have five minutes for questions. And I do see we have one um, in the box right now. Um, and the QR code is up for those that need it. Just scan the code. If you have any trouble, you can just um, email Susan Brulette, um, who is um, on, on the slide there, her address. So um, Amelia is asking how often the tools are updated. You know, with climate change um, and, you know, <laughs> things yeah. happening relatively quickly on that front, how often are these tools going to be updated? Um, 
So one of the cool things about the, the tools that we started developing in the Northeast is that we very much needed a way to easily update them. Believe it or not, the Midwesterners had kind of a clunkier process. I don't want to knock on them because they've been a great collaborator. Um, but, but the point here is that the tools can be updated easily. And in point of fact, we're still actively updating them um, as we're beginning the testing, well, completing the testing for the selector tool and the seating rate calculator and beginning training on them. In general, um, they are going to be, um, Susan, could you throw the URLs for the two tools if, if, you, can, if you can find them, please? Uh, in general, we're going to make every effort to update them as often as possible, but realistically, that's probably going to be like maybe once a year and only for issues that are raised. Uh, so all of our tools have a feedback button. And if you see information that looks wrong, let us know. Sometimes it's a typo. Typos happen in spite of our best efforts. And sometimes people don't agree on things like radishes. Do radishes break up compaction? Everybody who thinks yes, raise your hand mentally. Everybody th who thinks no, they grow sideways. Raise your hand. My understanding from the literature is that question has not been solved, has not been answered. And so um, sometimes things that don't look right in the data may simply be a matter of differing opinions. Um, that said, climate change specifically is something we've already addressed. Uh, the USDA hardiness zone map has been updated. They changed from using the 81 through 2010 normals to using the 91 through 2020 normals, if I've got the, the years right. They updated in the past 10 years have been even warmer. Um, and so on average, half of the US went up half a hardiness zone. So if you were zone 7A, now you may be zone 7B. That's not a big deal because in the tool, we went by whole zones. But when people jumped from 7B to 8A, that changed what hardiness zone they were in and potentially their data. So we went back to all of our folks that did data verification for us and we went, hey, look what happened with the hardiness zone map. Do you guys wanna revisit anything? And they told us, hey, we've been in the field for the last 10 years. The information you were giving us was not based on the hardiness zones per se, but on our experience in the hardiness zones. And so the actual number doesn't matter as much as the fact that it's current information. And so they declined to update um, simply because they didn't feel it was necessary. But yes, the issue of climate change is something that has hit our radar. Great, thanks, Victoria. There is another question about native plant cover crop options. Um, Anna's trying to increase the natives on her property. And I was curious, um, she's curious if you're gonna integrate them as cover crops. That is an awesome question. And we do not have a filter in the Midwest, Northeast or South for natives. Um, and I would have to like go through and look up the life histories of the plants because I know some of them are natives. I will say out West, their group specifically pushed to have some wildflowers included on their species list. Um, just because they're commonly planted, the seed is available, the farmers have ways to plant it. And so the ultimate answer to your question, unfortunately, is that while there are probably native plant cover crop options, the tool is not going to peg them for you. You're going to have to email extension or talk with a crop advisor. I'm muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> it is 1230 yeah. and um, we want to be mindful of everyone's time and the fact that these are sort of short webinars. So thank you, Victoria. I hope everybody can tune in. Um, can you post the QR code again, Susan, quickly? Somebody's asking yeah. for it. Um, hopefully you can tune in again next week. Jason Lilly from the University of Maine will be our presenter and um, really focused on vegetables and cover cropping. So please join us same time. Um, and hopefully you registered for all the webinars. If not, you'll have to go back in and register um, for that specific webinar. All right, thank you Thanks everyone. All. Have a great day. Thanks you Victoria. Too.